glad that you have joined us. We are here, the four of us, and we're gonna talk about all kinds of fun things out in the garden, in the landscape, whatever is most happening right now. That's what we plan to talk about. My name is Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois on the Urbana Champaign campus, and I'm in the Crop Sciences Department. So I'll talk about cut flowers or perennials, but I have three talented experts here with me, and let's find out their expertise, and then they're gonna maybe answer some viewer mail or do some show and tell. So I'm gonna throw it over first to Dr. Jim Angel. All right, well, thank you. Yes, I'm Jim Angel. I'm the state climatologist for Illinois. I'm here at the Illinois State Water Survey at the Prey Research Institute on the campus of the University of Illinois. Very good. And do you want to answer an email or a show and tell? Well, well uh, yes, we'll or answer an email weather. and at first, and then, or we could talk about the weather first. Yes, or, you could do that too. Okay, we, why don't we? Gardeners do? love that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we'll talk about the weather first. And we just came off the fifth warmest September on record. Uh, we're about four and a half degrees above average. It's also very warm now in the early part of October, but we can start thinking about fall. It does, we've had a few days where it's felt like fall, but most of the rest of the time it's felt more like late summer. But if you look at the, the next couple of weeks, we'll probably see our first fall frost. The average dates range from about early October in the northern part of Illinois. Here in central Illinois, it's about mid-October, and then it's about late October when you get into far southern Illinois. So they get a little longer growing season the farther south you go. Uh, this year, we haven't really had any widespread frost yet. In fact, we really haven't had that much cold weather yet. So probably in the next couple of weeks, we'll see that first cold snap. And, you know, sometimes you can play the odds and cover those plants and maybe get a little extra time out of them. You know, usually that time after that first fall frost, Sometimes there's a little bit of warm weather after that, and we call it Indian summer, and so you get a little extra growing season that way. We always enjoy extra growing season. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying the zinnias. So, well, we'll have you do a show and tell for the next go around, and we'll then throw it over to Marianne Metz. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Marianne Metz. Um, I am a, a horticulturalist and landscape designer and gardener and avid plant collector, uh, perennials, trees, uh, Japanese maples especially, hosta, lots of different things I have interest in. And this evening I'd like to do a show and tell first because I have a lot of cool things here. Um, as Jim was saying, we're kind of into fall and there's a lot of ways we um, celebrate fall with color and, and pumpkins and all that kind of neat stuff, but um, I'm I'm proposing that instead of chrysanthemums, not instead of, with, in conjunction with yes. using chrysanthemums for color, that um, you use some alternative things to brighten up your, your landscape and, and just around your home. It's beautiful. Um, I brought some uh, cabbage, actually cabbages, and kales are also available, Swiss chard, so many different things. But the color and texture that you can get from these things are just fabulous. And also the gourds, um, lots of different fun little things going on and I know there are people that know the names of all these gourds but that's not me. I just like the <laughs> colors and the shapes and textures <laughs> of them. I think they're awesome. Um, and uh, along with those I think ornamental peppers are just fabulous. I love this guy. Um, I have people ask me if these are actually edible. I don't know if they are or not. I'm not going to try them. Um, but the colors are just insane. Look at this great orange ornamental pepper. These are just great for fall color, um, along with celosia, which also has fabulous color to the landscape um, or to your mixed containers. Uh, this one called Intense is just a, a, a beautiful little guy. Just love it. But a, a great way to add color with your chrysanthemums or without pumpkins and all this kind of neat stuff. It makes our set look great. Thank awesome. you, Marianne. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to go to David Robson. Hi, I'm David Robson. I also work with the Crop Sciences Department at the U of I campus. I am a pesticide specialist uh, as well as a horticultural specialist. I guess if it uh, grows, I know a little bit about it, <laughs> uh, maybe some things a little bit more. Uh, I like Japanese maples and hostas like Mary Ann, and that's why we're, we're great friends. I want to talk about fall bulb planting, and this is the time of the year, uh, hopefully as the weather gets cooler, that we're gonna start putting some of the bulbs into the ground. Now, you can dig a hole and you can get your ruler out and make sure that it's six to eight inches deep for the big bulbs or three or four or even smaller. But I think in the long run, this is your best bet. Uh, 
This is a bulb auger. It looks like something dangerous, and Diane, I know, is backing away at the moment. <laughs> but this is an auger, uh, has a good, strong shaft to it. It goes into a drill. We've talked about uh, around this table that you really want a corded drill. You really don't want to look at a drill that's cordless. You can make three or four good holes with a cordless drill, but when you're getting with a corded drill, you're going to have that continual perpetual power. Uh, there may be some industrial or carpenter drills out there that maybe have more power, but for the average homeowner, I think your best bet is getting a corded drill, some good long extension cords, plug it in, get one of these uh, power planter augers. These are made actually here in East Central Illinois. Power planter is the type. They've been around for 20, 25 years. I think Diane gave me this one about 25 years ago. And as long as you clean it every year, it's going to keep lasting and lasting and lasting. And when you plant them, you know, they're perfect for the bulbs. This is about a, a nine inch planter there. Some of our bulbs like the alliums, and this is the uh, uh, Christophori allium right here. You just dig your hole, drop that in, throw a little fertilizer. And again, when you're fertilizing with the bulbs, use a complete fertilizer. They have bone meal out there, but Long ago, they proved that the nitrogen was just important with the bulbs. So make sure you have a fertilizer that has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Very good. Yes, those power planters are wonderful. It's a great company, good, strong, and we don't have stock in the company. No. It's just, <laughs> no. I'm sure there might be other ones, but we just don't know what they are. Okay, well, let's go to the Did You Know segment next. Did you know that mosquito repellents don't repel? The spray blocks the mosquitoes' sensors so they don't know you're there. Mosquitoes are also attracted to the color blue more than any other color. All right, well, we are going to go to your phone calls next. We don't have too many people who've called in, so you should give us a call. Let's go to Jim's uh, question about trees, and he's on line two. Hi, Jim. Hello. Yes, what's your question? My question is, how can I find a uh, good representative to uh, look at some trees that I have that uh, do not look normal? Oh, for someone to, to come and check out yours on site? Yes. I think the best uh, way to approach that is to certainly get a certified arborist. They, they usually um, are advertised in the, uh, your telephone directory online. I'm sure there are mm -hmm. probably ways to find that online, but definitely get a certified arborist. The International Society of Arboriculture or the Illinois Arborist Society or maybe any other state so arborist society have a listing of mm -hmm. the certified arborist who go through the trainings and very reputable as far as tree experts. Okay, so there you go, Jim. They can really give you the answer. Now, if you think it's insect, or especially if it's disease, you can send a sample to the plant clinic. And we used to have a screen that we can pull up about it, but it's here on campus. So uh, I don't know if we can get that done, but um, you can send a sample if it's a disease um, leaf or branch to the plant. And I lake. forgot that uh, every county office has something called DDDI, which is distance diagnostic with digital imaging. So okay. if you have digital pictures, you can take it to your county extension office. They can upload it. It comes to campus and we can quickly look at it. You still may need to get a professional out there, but we might be able to tell right off the bat what the problem is. That's so cool. now, you can think about plant clinic, your local extension folks, and certified arborists. So you've got three routes to go. Okay, thank you for your question. Let's go to Sue's question about crab apples, and she's on line three. Hello, Sue. Hello. Hi. We have a 20 year old crab apple tree, and it's blooming this time of year, which we've never had before, and we've noticed a few others doing that. Wondering what's causing that has a little bit to do with the climate this year. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you say so, Jim? I mean, it's yeah, been very it's, wet. Yeah, it's been very wet. I mean, early on it was dry. Uh, the first half of the year was fairly dry, and then it's it's gotten wet in the last, uh, especially in July and August. 
Uh, also, we've had some interesting temperature patterns. You know, we had some cooler weather early on, and then it's warmed back up again. So mm -hmm. it might be confused thinking it's the second summer or something. But uh, I had um, another flower on my bottle brush buckeye just about two weeks ago. Nice. And that has never, ever happened before. I've seen them on saucer magnolias mm -hmm. every now and then. Yes, I have mm -hmm. seen them quite a lot Crab of them apples, this year, more than normal. You know, that you mentioned. So sometimes the dry to wet, the cool to hot, and maybe a combination will shock them into flowering, which then will not flower next year, that area where the bud that is. One, right? Oh, yeah. But there will be other buds that will come yep. on. So it, you won't have lost anything. You've just can enjoy it for this fall as well. Okay, thank you, Sue, and that was a great comment. Thank you for that and the question. Well, we're gonna go to Glenda. Hey, it's everything's about trees. Oh, so Glenda has a question about fertilizing and trees. Hi, Glenda, line four. Are you there, Glenda, on line four? Kathy? I see Kathy, well, we'll go to yours. Yours okay. is about harvesting? Horseradish. Okay. Okay. So um, I've got some beautiful horseradish, um, and I need to harvest it, but I want to not harvest it so much that I don't get horseradish next year. That you will not get it? No, I want horseradish yeah. next year. That'll never yep. happen. I was going to say, <laughs> she has happen. to. If you can get rid of it in one year, you're, you're <laughs> really no, doing that will never special. happen. <laughs> yeah, you're going to leave a small part of it, and it's going to come back and... Okay. Even those little small roots, you can just mm -hmm. throw back into the ground and plant. Yeah. But yes. you so, have to go mm -hmm. out of so your way to get So give her some harvesting tips. <laughs> Make sure that the ground is moist when you harvest it because it's hard It'll to dig. Mm -hmm. um, keep the great big, you know, you really don't want them big and thick. I mean, carrot size is really going to give you your right. best flavor, which is why she should be harvesting every year. And then mm -hmm. just throw the little roots back into the ground and they'll probably... Or don't throw them back. Or don't into back the throw them back into the ground. But if you want them next year, throw them back into the ground, and they will again produce those great big leaves. Uh, I I don't think I've ever seen anybody actually kill horseradish it's by digging too or much over not or over harsh. No, not oh, yeah. accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> but if you do ever do that, let us know because yeah. I think that would be. More people would probably yeah. want to find that out. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they might. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, Kathy, you will not have any trouble um, over harvesting, I don't believe. They are vigorous growers. Yes, I think that's a and nice I way would of saying it. I mention yeah. that if she's going to grind it up, make sure she has good exhaust fan or do it outside well, do when it she's outside, doing it. Do it outside, and yeah. you might yeah. want eye protection. Yeah. Yeah. Right, oh yeah. Um, yeah. If you've never done it before, it's an experience. Yeah. And it is. And gloves. It's pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah. It is intense. And Illinois oh. is one of the leading horseradish producers in the world. I think yes. we have like 80% of the market or something Down in like Saint that. Down in St. Clair and yeah. Madison. Yeah. And yes. and that I was thinking area. that. Thank you for yeah. bringing that up. But it's, <laughs> yes. it's very good. And it's I love horseradish. Oh. And it's oh, fresh man. horseradish. Mm. Maybe not just by a spoonful, but mm. in, mm -hmm. in things. It's or really a good. a slab of beef. Ooh, mm. that's really good. <laughs> okay, but we're not hungry. Let's move on. Thank you for your question, Kathy. Let's go to Joanne's question about use, and it's on line two. Hi, Joanne. Hi. I wanted to know, I've got two huge views out in front, and I'd like to cut them down to a level equal to each other, um, maybe three or four inches, but I'm afraid to because I'm afraid it'll be naked and bare, bare grass, um, bare branches. Will it recover? And you want to print it to how much? Maybe uh, three or four inches down. Oh, three or four inches down. Okay. Oh, I thought she meant three or we four inches. We thought you meant from the ground. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. That's yeah. so much better. Yeah, they're, 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 about, they're about at least four foot tall. Okay. Nice. But they're not even, and I'd like to even them so that they're both the same sure. out in front. And uh, okay. one I'd like to cut down at least maybe an inch, and the other one about three or four inches. Okay, I see. All right, who wants to tackle that question? Well, sure, let's do yeah. it. <laughs> Use, uh, great for, to prune. If, if you were taking it down to three or four inches high, that would be a disaster. But taking three or four inches off of the top, um, is it going to be so bad? Um, there is a dead zone in use where you want to be careful not to, not to go back that far. They recover, but it takes many years to get back to, that, that, to, to a growth cycle. Um, they can be very cantankerous about regrowing. But taking three or four inches off shouldn't hurt an inch, certainly not. 
um, if it's about a four foot tall plant, I think that's what she said, about four foot mm -hmm. tall, so yeah. it, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, I, I would wait maybe um, to do that kind of pruning in uh, three or four weeks so they don't start growing again. Because pruning does say, hey, time let's, to grow. Yeah, yeah. Let's get uh, on Rusty Maldi ha Malding had the best uh, description of showing really flat topped yews, and he actually thinned out a little bit. So That's you, a nice you thing. You took to do. it down a little bit lower, and I thought yeah. that really was a. And he had a really ugly flat topped section of one. Well, and remember, we you know, always suggest that the top be narrower than the base, right. that it's going to look more like a trapezoid. But this had just yeah. it had yeah. been pruned so yeah. much. But the, the yeah. dead zone that Mary Ann talked about, occasionally they'll fool you and they'll see little growths clear down yeah. inside, and you can cut down to them. But she is right, it's going to take you. A long time. A long but time he just to barely took a, a little bit out, like it was very thick, and he took maybe a section like this out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. every six, eight Interesting. inches. Interesting. That's nice. And he says it works every time, Great. and that's what he does for a living. So <laughs> I thought that was an interesting thing to say. Thank you, Joanne, for your question. And now we're going to go back and do some uh, emails and maybe show and tell. So, Jim, I'm going to start back with you. Oh, okay. Well, we have a question from a Facebook user, and, and uh, they ask, what is the best course of action now and next spring for the huge influx of crabgrass? And I realize no one, one cannot both apply a crab grass preventer and overseed, so that is that is true. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the good news is that crabgrass is an annual, so it will go away as it gets cooler. In fact, I saw some today that was already looking pretty much, uh, pretty much like it's done. Yeah. Bad news is they're very prolific seed producers, so they're already got you set up for next year's crop. So yes, the, using the, the, the pre-emergence herbicide will help keep it down next year. Uh, and there's really not any easy way to get around using that and also overseeding. You gotta have one or the other pretty much. So I would say probably your first course of action is for this year, you don't have to worry about it anymore because we're at the end of the growing season. Next year, do the pre-emergent herbicide. And then also uh, do things like uh, make sure that your regular turf is in good shape so it has plenty of nutrients. And maybe if you cut your lawn short, don't cut it so short. Uh, mow like a, I always mow mine about two inches because that makes, gives the regular grass a pretty good fighting chance of kind of choking out some of the crabgrass and other weeds. Okay, crabgrass, er, yeah. uh, bummer. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Jim, and now Mary Ann. Well, I have a question from um, a viewer about a cherry tree, but actually it's a uh, two-part question. Uh, there's something, uh, this person's used Roundup under the tree uh, trying to get rid of a problem and if we could identify the weed and, and pretty sure that the weed is just a moss and there's also a, a weeping uh, wound at the base of the tree. So the, f the first part of this is yes, that's moss and, and that is uh, real indicative of another, of a soil problem, whether it's um, compacted uh, soil that doesn't drain well or just lack of nutrients. So th that's, that's an issue that you need to fix the soil um, if you want to grow something under the tree that isn't moss, but moss is green. I think sometimes you just mm -hmm. need to embrace it if you can't fix the soil issue. The drain, it's usually drainage. Um, and the cherry tree, um, my first thought was that it would be a, a, maybe a, a, a more wound but because there's nothing growing under the tree, it's not a mower wound, I'm quite sure, but a, a frost crack would be the other issue, which usually happens in the middle of the winter, uh, January, when we have uh, a freeze thaw, we have um, a lot of bright sun on really cold days, and the expansion and contraction just uh, makes the bark crack. And the weeping would certainly be part of the, the wound issue. And mostly for fr frost cracks, the, what to do is uh, clean the wound so that the, the, the crack is, has smooth edges and is attached to the tree uh, still. So if, there's, if it's curling back, you want to shave that off, make sure it's nice and clean, and then just let it uh, heal itself, and it will. It's usually, if it's not something that's going all the way around a tree, a wound in the bark going all the way around the tree, it's not going to kill the tree. Um, it could let in uh, some other pathogen, some, a disease or insect, but um, just keeping it clean and letting it heal itself is probably the best approach. Okay, very good, thank you. And now, David. 
We have a question that comes up uh, a lot this time of the year, and the, plant, the person has an endless summer hydrangea that was planted this July, and the leaves have developed. It's a disease called Cercospora. Uh, any ideas how to get rid of the disease? Now, this is a disease that you see in the uh, hydrangea that has a little purple spots. Uh, happens a lot on the big leaf hydrangeas, the macrophyllas, the ones that have the blue and the pink flowers. Also happens a little bit on oak leaf hydrangeas. It's a late season disease. It seems to occur more when there's hydrangeas that are going through hot, wet, hot, or I should say dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet conditions, especially during the summertime. The big leaf hydrangeas suck up a lot of moisture and if you don't keep them wet, they're gonna wilt, the disease comes in. It's a late season disease. We usually see it at the end of August, September. It has an appearance on the leaves. It really doesn't affect the plant's growth. Sanitation it is probably one of the best controls this fall when the leaves do fall. Pull the leaves off of the ground, put them in the compost pile. If you have mulch, put new mulch on it next spring. Kind of watch that moisture. But again, uh, if you're growing big leaf hydrangeas, the macrophyllas, this is a very common foliar problem, but it really doesn't do much damage to the plants overall. It's an appearance and aesthetic issue more than anything. Okay, very good. Well, I'm going to see if Glenda is on the line and we're gonna try line five. We tried her earlier. Glenda, do you have a tree question for us? Yes, I do. Yay, I oh, I'm glad you're here. And I wanna know when is the best time to fertilize, now or wait till spring? And what kind of fertilizer should I use so that they bloom? Okay. She said dogwood? Did you say dogwood? Yes. Okay. Well, fertilizing trees in the fall is one of the best times to do it because the roots will absorb the nutrients in the fall, not push out any new growth, but then come spring, that fertilizer, the nutrients are already absorbed into the roots and the tree can use it just like that. That being said, we tend to say on the flowering trees, you might want to hold off a little bit, maybe if they're a spring blooming tree, especially a fruit tree, you really don't want to fertilize in the fall. It's not that you're going to hurt the tree, you just may have, um, it, it, ultimately it may damage the blooms in the spring more than anything else. Uh, we usually say fertilize the trees uh, the middle to the end of October to the uh, middle of November. So now is the time that you can go ahead and do that. When I'm out there fertilizing, I really don't care if it's a blooming sp spring tree or shrub or a f uh, summer one. It gets fertilized and I really haven't had any deaths from the plants at that point. It's just okay. a different mindset to do it in the fall when the leaves are coming down. Mm -hmm. You're thinking, hmm, I'm stimulating growth, but you're really not. It takes that long for the tree to absorb it yeah. and okay. keep it till next spring. A good primer on fertilizing trees. Thank you, Glenda, for being patient. And let's go to Jim's question on line three about planting. Hi, Jim. Hello. Hi there. What's your question? Well, I am an old, old man. <laughs> you sound young. Every Memorial Day visit old, old cemeteries where we have ancestors. Almost all of those old cemeteries have got a lot of peonies. Some, and I just wonder, and I, I meant to call you right when I saw it this year. We have a few peonies, but how do you transplant them and when? Okay, I'm looking at you, Marianne. Well, great, because I can tell him <laughs> when. <laughs> Jim, this is just the perfect time to be doing that, um, digging up the roots, dividing them, cleaning them up, doing whatever you need to do to them. It, it's such a great plant to share. They, they just, they, they develop so well root-wise. Um, but definitely when they've quit growing, that when end of the summer, their leaves start looking not so nice. Um, can cut the stems down, but now is definitely the time to dig them up and replant them. Divide them if you'd like. Um, usually f uh, three to five eyes, those are the little growth eyes, they're pink or white on the top of the plant, um, and as many roots. Sometimes people like to start with a little bigger one, but the, they're literally usually the most vigorous between three and five eyes. So if you can do that and clean up any rot that might be on them and replant them, they'll love you. 
and give the planting death? Because I, I know a lot of people oh, plant them yes. too deep. That's exactly right. There's the, no greater way to make a, a peony not bloom than to plant it too deep and, and sometimes uh, too shallow. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that growth eye I mentioned should be three to five, um, I'm sorry, one to three inches below the soil surface. And if you plant it too deep, a little deeper than that, it'll probably not bloom for you. And sometimes you, you don't get the flower for maybe a couple of years. But um, yeah, one to three inches and you should be fine. Great. Well, that was perfect timing. Thank you for your question. And I want to thank each of you for watching us and for you folks being here. I hope you have a great week gardening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.